There we go. And welcome everyone to uh, this New Brunswick Cattle Producers production of um, kind of Genomics 101. So what the New Brunswick Cattle Producers have kind of br brought together is uh, a representative from Neogen who is sort of world-class leader in genomic, genomic testing. And they've developed some new things that um, are available to the, to the commercial grower and that kind of previously had been reserved for the purebred registries and uh, purebred folks. So it's sort of a little bit of innovative technology at a price point that's pretty reasonable to help you uh, make decisions about retention and some things in your herd. So uh, I would like to welcome Nikki from Neogen. And Nikki, I don't know if you would just like to give yourself a little bit of an introduction. And um, Nikki's gonna go through just from a timing perspective, a presentation that's about 30 to 40 minutes long. If you do have any questions, you can type them in the chat box or uh, raise your hand and we'll sort of try to modify um, and stop for questions as we go a little bit. And if you've got something that's burning, just uh, throw it into the chat box and we'll be able to get it fielded. So without further ado, and to keep things on time, I will throw it over to Nikki. If you'd just like to give yourself a quick introduction, Nikki. Yes, for sure. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> so my name is Nikki Westerson and I am with Neogen Canada. So I am the Western Canada uh, beef genomics territory manager. Our lab is based in Edmonton, Alberta. We are uh, globally uh, the largest agrogenomics uh, lab and provider that there is. And I grew up on a farm just about, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes southeast of Calgary, Alberta on a small mixed uh, commercial cow-calf operation. So I did a few years in more of the crop production sector, uh, working for some chemical companies and now have made it back to my roots, I guess, and have, are back in the beef industry and have been with Neogen for just about two years. So thank you to the Maritime Beef Council for getting us involved in this project and allowing us to kind of come here and help everyone get acquainted with genomics, genomic testing, how it can help you and how to do it. So that's kind of what we're here to talk about today is basically what is genomic testing, um, otherwise DNA testing, how it can help you, uh, why to do it. And then I think we have some consecutive webinars planned to kind of dive into the the why a little bit more and kind of how to interpret some of those results. So if you have any questions, definitely bring them up and we'll try our best to get them answered. So DNA one-on-one, one, one on one, it's kind of what we'll call it. So who is Neogen once again? So we're a large agrogenomics company, but we also have a food safety division as well as an animal safety division. So that ranges anywhere from uh, COVID tests. So we're doing kind of manufacturing some of those to uh, salmonella, some of those bacterial testing in the food safety, animal safety. We do manufacture some veterinary equipment and then genomics um, is the whole other gamut of genetic testing. So we do have a global presence uh, anywhere where there is kind of the orange strand of DNA is where our labs are. So we have a lab in Canada, the United States, Scotland, Australia, all over, we're kind of doing acquisitions and have grown quite a bit in the last five to 10 years. So, and then as far as the genomic services sector of our business, what we test is basically anything with DNA. So we do some alpaca, we have some spruce tree DNA, um, we can do some kind of microscopic organisms. Uh, we do a lot of uh, mice testing for some of the human research sides of things. Uh, we do environmental studies testing. We've just launched some bison products to help measure cattle integration and speciation. And we're getting into some uh, aquaculture. So we're always expanding and growing and really trying to utilize new technology and help make food and uh, biological production more effective and better at the end of the day. So an introduction to DNA. Um, basically, DNA is made up of different base pairs. There are four different base pairs, A, T, C, and G. Uh, the A's binds to the T, the C's to the G's, and 
why we explore DNA in cattle and why it's worth looking at because there is about 2.8 billion base pairs. So there can be a ton of different combinations, which in turn results in a ton of different variation within the animals. So when I say genotype, that is referring to the actual DNA of the animal and what genetically we can either predict or estimate and what uh, the genes or the DNA molecules actually telling us about that animal. When I say phenotype, that is what we're seeing. So that is if the animal has uh, horns or if it's pulled or if it has a uh, coat color is black versus done or um, some of those things. So the things you see are the phenotype, the things you don't see that we test for is the genotype. So then what we are looking for when we are testing that genotype is we are looking for differences in the SNPs. The SNPs are the single nucleotide Polymorphism. So those are the A's and the T's, the C's and the G's. So the differences in those SNPs and what they bind to results in the differences in the phenotypes So what we see. So when we look at these three animals, we notice at this one sequence, uh, two of the animals have a G, one has a T. That could be the result of that animal having horns or not. Uh, the next animal, two have C, one have A. That could be the difference in even like the claw set or foot structure of the animal. So that's what we are looking for. And we are identifying different gene markers and trying to correlate changes. And then that is how we kind of de determine the testing for these traits and to help that make them applicable to help you guys predict changes and ultimately pick out the best animals um, based on the genotype and kind of what the animal actually is. So when you actually want to test, how do you get the samples to the lab? How do you even go about doing the DNA testing? So best place to start, as in with most places um, and most companies and service providers, our website. So if you go to our website at neogen.com, uh, you'll come kind of, this is our homepage and you just gotta kind of navigate it to order your sampling equipment. So first thing is to register an account. Once you have an account, you can place your orders, you can play around, um, you can set your address, all of that stuff. And then that kind of gets you started with us. And then you go down to sampling equipment. So then you're gonna pick either one of the next two sampling equipment types that I talk about. And once you have the equipment, you can get started. So how do you take a DNA sample? So it does need to be taken using a sample collector um, that we sell, either because it has a barcode on it. So the two different types that are mainly used are a tissue sampling unit or a hair card. So the benefits of each are very uh, operational dependent, but they're both very effective. So this is the TSU. So it is a small vial that punches a little piece of ear tissue into some fluid. And then you just send that little capsule in and that's what helps us to take the, uh, extract the DNA from the sample. Or you can use a hair card. Uh, and then we actually take the follicles from the hair and put it in and begin the DNA extraction process. So anything that is sent without using one of these sample collectors, it will have a $4 loose hair charge um, just because we do have to then go and put it on these collectors and uh, keep it straight and organized. And the amount of static in a DNA lab is pretty, pretty insane. So we do like to have these collectors to keep it neat and tidy and organized. So a tissue sampling unit, it's very fast, it's high performance, um, long lasting. A uh, few tips and tricks is there is a lot of garbage um, associated with these things because it is DNA. So it does have to be very sterile, um, individual. Every uh, tissue sampling unit does have a new needle, a new clip, all of that. So uh, you do need to keep it organized, but once you have a system down, they do go lickety split. It's very easy and fast to do if you are processing a lot of animals and the process for loading it. So you do have to order an applicator gun. So you're going to take your TSU, uh, you load it into the gun, then you're going to make sure that it's in there securely. Uh, then you're going to squeeze the handles together. 
And then that is going to kind of engage the TSU. And then once you release the handles, it will expose the needle, um, which will be the actual device that punches the piece of the tissue into the vial. And you pull the red plastic clip and that takes it out. That goes into the garbage. And then you position the gun over the ear. I don't know, a couple inches from uh, the outside of the ear. Try not to get any major veins or anything. And you just quickly close it. It very cleanly and quickly takes a little piece of tissue. That tissue ends up in the vial. And once you see kind of in that picture, the green stopper, once that is plunged into the vial, the tissue is taken effectively and it has created a seal on the fluid. And then to remove the used cutter, because um, each TSU sample does have its own needle and it does need to be um, removed and put back for each sample. You just pull the handles apart, that goes in the garbage. So it is a very fast and easy process. Um, the biggest thing is to make sure that your records are very accurate. Each TSU does have a barcode on it or a number. So you wanna make sure that it's correctly associated with the animal ID. Um, just so that we can process it at the lab correctly and for your records that it is submitted correctly. If you are using a hair card to take your DNA samples, this is what it looks like. Um, so it is a very effective way. Uh, you wanna make sure that you include the animal's ID uh, or if you have any other details about the animal, they don't uh, have a tendency to kind of need as much of association or a different list is just you can mark it down and send it in. So that's kind of nice about the hair card. It's not quite as clean or as fast for taking the sample as the TSU, but it is still fairly um, straightforward. And the hair cards, once they are taken, you can store them at room temperature indefinitely and it'll uh, create a really nice sample product too. So how to use the hair cards, how to actually take the sample. You're gonna go to the tail switch um, tail swatch of the cow and you're going to kind of dig through some of the fur or the hairs until you get to about the middle and then you're going to try and kind of wrap about I don't know 50 to 60 hairs around your fingers and you're going to pull that up and then once you pull it up you're going to expose all these big meaty nice follicles on the roots of the hair and that is where the DNA is actually contained. So I know in some CSI TV shows and that, they'll grab a hairbrush and take DNA. That doesn't happen. If there's no follicles, that hair does not have any DNA. So you can't just pull it anywhere on the body. You can't just cut it. It needs to have the follicles. So once we have that, then there'll be an effective sample. You open up the hair card. And so it's basically just a business card with some uh, tape on it essentially. So you're going to pull back the sticky part, put the follicles on the hair card, and then you're going to reapply the plastic cover. And then you can just trim it because all we need is the follicles. Um, mark down your animal's information on that hair card, and then you're done. That's uh, effective sample collected. So when it comes to organizing some of them, so we do need to make sure that the barcodes for both if you're keeping records um, for the barcodes for both the TSUs and the hair cards are correlated to the correct animal ID for submission. Um, if you are going to be submitting online, then there is a process to use the Excel form that is on the identity beef submission to record the samples. So I do feel that some, some producers might be submitting their own orders online. So we'll just walk through how and where to find that. So how to submit. So you're here on our website. You are going to scroll down and if you actually find the product, so we'll go to solutions and then we will go to the identity profiles because the identity beef profile is what we're going to be looking at today. And it's going to take you here and then you're going to just go until you see the identity beef profile. We have a whole gamut, um, including some dairy products and everything. So you want to find the identity beef. That's going to pull up this page. And then there you'll see the submission form. You're going to click and you're going to download that. 
And then that is the submission form that once you have your samples collected, you will use and you can submit this directly online versus printing out a form um, or if you wanted to do it online, this is what you do. And any of these fields that are highlighted in red are the ones that must be filled in. So it's a drop down tab for some of them. So for sample type, you would put uh, either a hair card or TSU, sample barcode, each TSU or, bar, bar, or hair card, sorry, has a barcode on it. So you just put that, the animal ID. You do have to select a breed. Um, just put the majority breed of what you feel that animal is. It doesn't make any difference. It's just, uh, it's part of the process. And then sample type, what kind of sample it is. And then if you did want to add on any sort of genetic traits, whether it's um, a horn pulled test, any sort of defects, any of that, you can do it all there. So that's how you get the submission form. Once you have selected uh, which sample collector you're going to use, and then you've taken the samples, once you have that, then you fill in this form. And then basically the hard part as, uh, as they say is done in that regard. So, and then how you would submit it. Um, well, here we go. So then this is just, uh, I guess the, the, the beef online submission form once again. So if you are going to be submitting, uh, paper, then we do have that link kind of on our website too. And it's very similar. We just need to make sure that we have the sample ID and the animal ID correct. And we can go from there. So then once you've taken your samples, you've filled out your paperwork, what do you do next? So the lab process, we do have our lab based in Edmonton, Alberta. So it is a Canadian lab and the process of DNA testing, it's not magic. It's very scientific, it's very processed, and your samples, they do quite a bit of travel. So when they do come to us, they come to Edmonton and we will receive them. So our sample reception team will receive them, make sure that everything is understood on the test that you want for those samples, uh, what the samples are for, all of that stuff. And then they will go into sample preparation and then DNA extraction and quality control. So we extract all of the DNA at our lab in Edmonton. Once that DNA is extracted, we do ship it down to Lincoln, Nebraska. And that is where it gets um, used on the different chips and arrays and actually does all of the imputations and everything. And the actual testing happens down there. Once the testing is done. Um, the data and the information does get sent back to Edmonton. We analyze it and deliver it to either the different breed associations or run it against um, our programs. And then the test results get delivered to the producers. And then the producers can go and use those results to help them make decisions for their animals. So all of that takes about 21 calendar days. So if you are looking to have your cattle brought back from pasture or something, say in October, weaned in November and wanna make decisions at that time, the best time is to make sure that you have at least three weeks prior to when you wanna make decisions, those samples into the lab so that we can make sure that we have enough time to get you those results that you're looking for to help you out um, in your herds. So one of the things that we'll talk just quickly about is parentage testing and kind of how it works. So when you mate your sire and your dam, uh, they each donate one copy of each allele to the calf. So say the sire is AA, dam is BB, calf will be AB. So then what we're looking for with parentage testing is to measure who's basically the sire of which. So it's very effective and handy in multi-sire pastures if you don't know um, who the sire of your calves might be. And what it can help do is it can really help you determine who's the sire of the calves you really like and who's the calves, sire of the calves that you don't really like. So you can help use that. So we just look at these different markers and we'll look for matches and mismatches. So this first calf, um, it can be a match to any of those pairs. This one, 
It can't, the calf is lacking the B, so it's not gonna be a match to that sire. This it obviously wasn't an effective uh, sample, so it's not gonna work there. What actually equals a qualified par uh, parentage match is we analyze about 216 different SNPs and it has to be greater than a 97% match for us to say this sire is qualified as uh, the calf's sire. So that is kind of the very quick process of parentage testing and then why we do it too. And why DNA testing and genomics is important in general is because of genetic recombination. So if we look at this next example of pedigrees and DNA. So you have one, uh, the sire is 100% Angus, dam is 100% limousine. They are each going to donate a section of their DNA to this progeny. So the expected progeny is that it's going to be 50% Angus, 50% limo. So when then after these two are mated, the actual progeny, it does come out 50% Angus, 50% limo. Now we're gonna take this, um, so this F1 progeny uh, is a heifer. So we're gonna take that heifer and we're gonna breed her to a sire or a scimitol bull. Then the progeny that we would expect out of that would be 50% scimitol, 25% um, Angus, 25% limo. What actually happens because of genetic recombination is we are gonna get that 50% from that scimitol donated. But then what we might get is different batches. We're not gonna get a full 25% of Angus, full 25% of limo. We're probably, in this example, we're getting a little bit more from the limo side of it. So the actual progeny, comes out 50% scimitol, only 15% Angus, and 35% limo. So that is why DNA testing, genomics testing for these different traits is so important because you don't know what is actually happening in genetic recombination. We can predict and estimate and plan, but the way that the DNA is actually donated from each of the animals when you are mating them is totally up to nature. And that is what equates to the variations in different siblings in why some grandkids look more like the grandparents than their actual parents. And even when we look at straight full bred uh, siblings, they're only gonna be 30 to 60% similar in DNA. So what genetic testing does is it does highlight those traits that we do like and actually tells them what is being passed down and where versus just guessing. So then kind of going on to a little bit about where genomics started in the beef industry uh, for the EPDs uh, and using it there for uh, expected progeny differences. And then when we add the genomic DNA testing to that, we get genomically enhanced EPDs. So what is a genomic evaluation? And then this is what we are doing with the commercial herds also, is we are producing a genomic evaluation. So it's a prediction of how an animal's offspring will perform on traits. And it's usually displayed as a charted numbers. Um, so we talked about kind of the EPD versus the GEPD. What does adding genomics to the equation do? It increases accuracy. So when you're taking a young bull and he has no progeny, never sired a calf before, you have no idea really what he's going to get. He might have only had a birth weight of 70 pounds, but that doesn't mean he might not throw some 90 pound calves. Um, so there's just some of those information that you do want to know um, before you go and breed him to your entire herd. And you might end up pulling a lot more calves than you intended to. But when you do add <clears throat> the genomics and his DNA profile, his genotype to that, it increases the accuracy. So it's almost already like, oh, he's already had a batch of calves. This is what we can expect. So it helps you to make a lot of really good decisions before that animal has reproduced. And uh, when they are, especially for young animals, before they have gone on and you keep them in the herd, helps you make a decision if you want to keep them or get rid of them. So why would you profile your cattle? Um, some phenotypes, what you see and what you get, those traits aren't heritable. 
Uh, what you actually see is a fraction of the picture. DNA inheritance, it's not equal. We can't always predict it. And the recombination, it produces different combinations with different traits. So what we're gonna look at next is the identity beef profile. So it provides a very objective measure uh, for heritable traits. So it's only gonna evaluate and measure the traits that will be passed down because things like fertility or uh, hybrid vigor, heterosis, those traits are not heritable. And those are a lot of kind of what that animal possesses for their own, but it's not gonna pass on to their offspring. Still great traits, still measurable, but uh, if we're selecting replacement heifers or looking for herd expansion, quite often we do want to keep the heifers that are gonna have heritable traits passing on to the next generations that are gonna help grow and progress our herd in the changes that we see. So how can genomics help? We look at some of the issues that Canadian farmers are dealing with right now. Market prices, fertility, feed costs, weather. You guys are super wet. Um, out west here, we're super dry. So if, if it's looking at, uh, if you have a lot of feed, you're still gonna wanna feed out the best animals you can. If you don't have a lot of feed, you're gonna wanna feed out those heifers or keep the heifers that you know are actually gonna produce a calf for the next six years and not that you're gonna feed out and then you're not gonna have uh, the fertility to breed or rebreed. So uh, if it's a cost, cost over investment over uh, information, then it is a good, definitely a good value and good information to have to make those decisions. So genomics can help. We can also look at what are your goals in your herd? If it is to expand your herd, um, make sure that you're keeping the best heifers. If you're looking to feed out some animals, make sure that you are feeding uh, good quality animals that are gonna feed effectively and have good carcass traits. Um, and it also helps to mitigate some risk if you are selling your animals and you want to really make sure that you are producing some tender, well-marbled meat, well, select some animals that might have those traits in their genotype beforehand and it'll help you get there, get you there to your goals faster. So the two commercial profiles that we're kind of referencing that are much like EPDs for the commercial producer, uh, the identity beef profile, as well as in bigger. So we'll talk a little bit about those. So the identity beef profile, it is basically the first and only complete heifer profile tool that measures 16 different traits. So it is gonna measure these traits and it's gonna give you a score between one to 10 on each of these traits. Simply put, we consider five average for these traits. If the animals are above five, probably above average, below five, below average. What these traits tell us is um, basically an estimation of what that heifer or that animal is gonna possess or not possess, um, deliver and give to their offspring and their progeny. So when we look at these traits, what it can do is it'll help you rank and select replacement heifers that are going to help meet your future goals. You can also produce some feeder cattle if that's what you are looking to fit into your market. Uh, if you're raising your own commercial bulls, it can help score those commercial bulls so that you do have an estimation of birth weight, yearling weight, weaning weight, some of those valuable things. <coughs> and it also does include uh, sire parentage. So if you are have a couple heifers that you don't know the sire of, but you know it's one of your bulls, you can always run that test there and that is included. So the traits that are reported, uh, we have maternal traits. So you're gonna get a score of one to 10 on birth weight, calving ease direct, calving ease maternal, heifer pregnancy rate, milk, stability, docility. Stability is, um, to kind of describe that trait a little bit, it is the chances of that animal staying in the herd for six or more years. So that's a very uh, valuable trait to have because that factors in that animal's basically lifespan. And it takes a couple calves for a heifer to pay for herself and to kind of justify keeping her around essentially. 
So if you have an animal with high stability scores, that means they're going to have good fertility. They're probably going to have some pretty good feed on them. They're going to be effective at getting rebred and raising a calf to maturity. So that's a very important trait. Um, milk, it's not in essentially like pounds of milk produce. It contributes of how that heifer is going to feed that calf. So the pounds of weaned calf basically based on kind of how efficient that animal is going to be at producing milk. Uh, the only thing else to note on this side, I guess, is for birth weight, a lower score is essentially better. Um, so it kind of goes against the gradient of a one to 10 score. So a 10 is going to be a way bigger birth weight of that heifer's calf or that progeny that they're going to have. Um, a lower score is going to be a lower birth weight. So for the growth traits that we evaluate, so you get a one to 10 score on weaning weight, average daily gain, yearling weight, and residual feed intake. Uh, residual feed intake is the only other trait that you do want a lower score on. So a lower score on the RFI trait is going to equate to a more efficient animal. So that's going to mean that they're going to be more efficient at converting pounds of food to pounds on the frame. So a lower RFI and a high average daily gain means that that animal is going to grow pretty quick. Um, weaning weight, what kind of estimation of what size that animal is going to be at weaning time, yearly weight as a year. So if you can get kind of a heifer with a lower birth weight and a higher weaning weight and yearling weight, that means that heifer is going to raise some calves that grow quickly and efficiently. For the carcass traits, uh, we measure marbling, ribeye area, <clears throat> fat thickness, tenderness, and hot carcass weight. So if there is any sort of direct farm marketing opportunities or anything like that, this is really great um, traits to look at to make sure that you're selecting some of the best tasting animals and uh, ones that are going to perform and be really satisfactory to help market that those traits also. So once you have all the numbers for those 16 traits, you can also then go and use our indexes for multi-trait selection to help you select which animals you're actually going to keep and which animals based on the scores are the ones you're looking for. So we do have um, a maternal index, which it takes in different weights of different maternal traits. Uh, we have a production index, which is just kind of the general, if you're keeping bulls, heifers, steers, whatever, um, what genomically those animals are gonna have a high production. And then terminal is based solely kind of for uh, the carcass market and what that is gonna be like. So all of this, uh, all of these results are displayed in a dashboard. So each uh, person that's involved in the program will get their own dashboard set up and they can go on and view their results and you can rank and sort and analyze your animals on the dashboard. And so what the, that actually looks like is, so you'll be given, you'll be emailed out this link and this is our dummy account. So it's confidence at igenity.com password confidence. So this is just the play one. So I'll go in, you come to the screen, you select your animals, then you view your herd results and it's gonna load and it's gonna show all your animals and then all the different traits. So you go across the top and you'll see all of these different traits. So you have birth weight, calving ease direct, calving ease maternal, docility, pregnancy. They all have a number. They all have a score for each trait. The bottom is just kind of the averages of the different traits. But then from here, you can go and you'll see the animal under uh, the animal ID. So you can rank and go through that to generate the indexes, you go up to tools, custom index, then you're going to select the index. So say you're looking for a maternal index if you're doing a heifer selection. So it sorts it. So it ranks all these traits and it has different weightings. So we think that um, weaning weight is pretty important, how that animal is going to breed back, how she's going to deliver the calf, um, and how efficient she's going to be. And we have a weighted index 
you select that, you add that column, and then it automatically sorts these animals. So we would call it the identity maternal index, and it's going to take them and it's going to rank them. So it gives one score based on all of those six or seven different traits. So if we want to add another index, say we want to add um, the production index, this is just kind of the general ranking one, it gets added right beside it. So then that takes all of those traits and it gives them one number. So that's a really easy way to effectively sort and rank a group of animals once you have your dashboard results delivered. Um, so it is going to be a lower, like we can see with uh, the maternal index, the highest score is about what, a 3.75. So it is a weighted average. So it's not going to be kind of the five is average plus or minus. It really is just going to rank all the animals and give it a weighted index. So it's, it's a very effective tool, um, but you can go in and you can play around with that a lot. So once the results for these animals have been processed, um, then everyone is emailed a dashboard account. They get their own dashboard account with a link and then you can go in, you log in, you view your herd and then you can sort and rank and really kind of play around. If you would rather work in an Excel file, there is a section where you can download it to Excel. Um, maybe for your, your records, that's what works better, but you can really do a lot with this information and it's it's there forever until you let us know that the animal has passed or you can actually go in and uh, deactivate animals if you've sold them they've died whatever uh, reason that is so it makes it very current and relevant to the animals that are in your operation right now so Next product we'll talk just a little bit about is the Invigor profile. So the Invigor profile, it is a genomic profile that measures heterosis of crossbred cattle. So it's gonna give you a, a score from one to 10, basically on how many breeds, what the high, uh, how hybrid that cow is bred. So a score of one means that animal's purebred. So if it's a full bred Angus or, um, full breed Simital, it's only going to have a score of one. If it's kind of a 50-50 mix, it might have a score of two or three. If it's uh, what we were looking at earlier, where it's a limo, Angus, and Simital, it could have a score of four to five. So what that indicates is a higher level of heterosis. What heterosis or hybrid vigor actually does is it does increase fertility. Um, so the those animals, they are going to be more fertile. And that's a huge, huge factor um, for so selecting replacements, obviously. Uh, lower cull rates. So actually, it does produce healthier cattle. Um, even in the feedlot scenario, we have done a lot of work measuring uh, heterosis and hybrid vigor in the feedlot. And it's way less health incidences in the animals that do have a higher level of heterosis. They wean better. Um, or they wean higher weighted, I guess, when we look at that, uh, the more pounds weaned per cow exposed and greater feed efficiency. So it is a very interesting things. Um, a lot of it is what commercial producers have known and been breeding towards for a long, long time, but now we actually have a tool to measure it. So sometimes if you guys think that you have a highly crossbred cow or that old kind of cow that you can't quite figure out what breed she is, chances are she probably has a really high in vigor score. And she's the one that's going to keep on getting pregnant year after year, never have any feed issues, never have any of that stuff. So it's a really interesting test, um, especially for uh, when it is a stressful environment. The hybrid vigor is going to be really what sets some of these animals apart from um, the other ones. So really effective tool. Differences between the two profiles. So the identity beef profile, those scores and those traits, those are the ones that are heritable. So they're gonna be passed down to the future generations and you're really gonna help make genetic progress in your herd if you are trying to have a herd that raises higher wean calves or have um, a herd that's gonna have less calving incidences and be easier to calve out or uh, some of those things. In vigor, 
that is those scores are not heritable. So heterosis and hybrid vigor is not heritable, but it will measure kind of, it'll help you select females that are gonna be in your herd for a long time and be very high producing. So you can do both tests and it gives you a, a great uh, full picture effect on those animals. And then we can also determine what we call a total cow index. So it's gonna take what are the heritable traits, add in that animal's individual hybrid vigor and it'll spit you out one number and then that'll be the best way to really predict what uh, animals are gonna be the most high performing and pass on the most desirable traits for future years and generations. <clears throat> so just to kind of summarize a little bit about that, um, cause we were talking kind of how to get started in genomic testing and kind of why I would do it and uh, kind of the processes around that. So to bring it back, how do you order? You go to our website, you purchase your sampling equipment. Um, once you've received that, you collect your samples. Probably the next time that you're running your animals through, uh, it's definitely easier, doesn't take long, it's very easy. Make sure you keep accurate records of the animal ID to the sample. And then you can download um, or complete the order form on our website and submit it that way. And then once that is submitted, either the paper copy or online, you mail us the samples to our lab in Edmonton. We process it. We deliver the results to you. I will um, help go through the results or Amy I know is offering farm consultations on how to use the results um, for each farm through the Maritime Beef Council. And you go through that, figure out what works and how to make some of those decisions and make it very really valuable for you. So that's kind of the 101 uh, Reader's Digest version of how to get into genomics testing and where to use it. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'm definitely available to help support this program and to help support anyone who needs help or has needs further information or wants more information on some of um, the other testing that we do offer and what we can do for you guys. So make sure that if something's a little fuzzy, let me know and I'll definitely try and get the answers for you if I don't know them. So was there any questions that have popped up so far? One question that we often get, and I would I would invite people to use the chat box or quickly unmute themselves if they would like to ask a question live. But um, one question that I know I've gotten um, a lot before is how young can the calves be? Like the hair sample, they need to be a certain age for the follicles to sort of fall out correctly. Is that right? Yeah, I'd give them a few days. Like it's gonna, it's gonna vary a little bit with each, um, but give them a few days. Um, the nice thing about the tissue sample, you can use it anytime, right? Because the tissue has is the tissue where the hair, um, their skin is pretty moist and soft. And when they're born, they're born wet. So give them a few days just to kind of get completely dry, up, moving a little bit. And then you can take the samples and it's, it's going to be effective. Excellent. And while we're waiting, if we're waiting for a few other questions to come in, um, I would like to give a plug to the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture's uh, CAP program has a couple of different ways that you can help that that help you to perform some of this stuff. And one is a in the livestock uh, genetic enhancement program, which many of you might be familiar with from because you refer to it as the bull bonus program or the elite female program. So in that same bout of paperwork, I don't know if you've ever noticed um, there is a beef genetic testing component to that. And it basically can cover things like herd genetic evaluation programs, um, the herd enrollment in purebred data collection um, systems, ultrasound testing, and genomic testing. 
So assistance level for that is 100% up to a maximum of $500 per head in that kind of combined combined bucket. So I think once you do the math on that, I think it can be upwards to maxing out at 11, um, about 11 samples per year if you were to use that 100% bucket just on genomic testing. So it would be pretty much covered through that program, which is just a little bit of paperwork. And you've got some people in the part department who'd be probably pleased, and a few of them are on the call here, pleased to help you out with that. That's awesome. And the other plug would be that new this year um, has been a revised genetic, uh, a beef renewal, herd, the herd renewal and improvement program. And within the advanced, so there's two different assistance levels in that program and the advanced herd growth program um, requires some genetic testing on um, replacement heifers before they, uh, before they go through through the system. So take a look at that one as well. It's uh, it again, it's new this year. I know that the that was emailed out back in, I want to say May, it's on their website. And so this is an entry level to getting some of that extra, the extra funds if you're retaining heifers um, for growth. So a couple, couple things there, the, the funding does make it very accessible. Um, I know a lot of folks that I talk to in other provinces are quite jealous that we've got gen genomic testing that's pretty much 100% covered to a certain um, to a certain amount. So it it can be a really a really interesting tool. And I'll pause there and see we don't have anything coming up. Um, in terms of questions, but I'll pause so that if anybody wants to unmute themselves to ask a question, we'll be more than, they are more than welcome. Good evening, Nikki. Thanks for the presentation. Good to see you. Hope things are well with you. I know things dry out west, so hearts are out to you guys for, for what you're dealing with. We, we're very familiar. We went through it last last summer, so um, just wondering about traction, I guess, and and you know how this technology is being used out west. And do you see increases? Are are folks starting to get a handle on how do we deploy this uh, in the beef sector? I get because it's been it's been more widely used in the dairy sector for years from what I understand and we're kind of catching up in, in the beef sector. So is there a trajectory there? Yeah, for sure. So it was kind of um, used in the dairy sector, but also from that, we got to learn a lot from dairy's mistakes in using genomic testing. When they first started using it, it was only selecting based on milk, right? Make as much milk, with as little feed as we can, milk, milk, milk. They didn't look at all the traits. They didn't have a program like this. And then they ended up with cows that couldn't get pregnant, right? So then they weren't taking a very holistic approach and they were only looking at kind of one sector of the industry where now we know not to do that, which is why we do have the full profiles. So as far as traction, yeah, like we we're definitely picking up quite a bit more. Um, we're seeing it used in many different ways. I have had producers that have larger herds um, and we've tested all 30 of the bulls to really figure out what they are about and what sort of genetics are being passed down. Um, Cause with crossbred bulls too, there is nothing that nothing on the market that you can get an evaluation like this. Um, with the seed stock bulls, you can use the EPDs and really get a good estimation of where you're going. I, I have quite a few guys that if they're keeping, I don't know, 30 replacement heifers and they've sorted off 40, they'll test all 40 and keep the top 30 based on sort of the traits that they're looking to do. So it's really being used in many, many different ways. We have some small breed associations that don't have an actual evaluation process yet, just because of their size and numbers and the amount of genotypes that you have to have are starting to use it as just a tool for selecting animals that um, align with those breeds. So we have some Wagyu producers 
that are using it, just benchmarking it within their own herds um, and selecting based on that. And then we have some of the other smaller breeds that are kind of using it as their evaluation process and it's working really good there. So um, there's not just one use for it, which is really cool, I think. And it really speaks to uh, the actual, the, the, like how valid the product is gonna be and what it can do for everyone. So we are backed by all of the evaluations. Our reference population is IGS, which is International Genetic Solutions. So that means it's a huge database and a ton of Canadian cattle, which is relevant. We want to evaluate Canadian cattle against Canadian cattle because different traits are gonna be important for us. Like stability um, is a huge trait especially when it's evaluated against Canadian cattle, because our calves or our animals live in plus 40, minus 40, mud, snow, wind, rain, whatever. Down in Arizona, down in Florida, those animals don't. The weather's the same all the time. They don't ever have to go through that stuff. So stability is not a trait they look at. Where up here, we want those animals to stay in the herd for six years. And we want them measured against the ones who have done that. So uh, different traits are definitely going to be important to different people, but as far as finding a fit for it and a fit for each herd, they're, it's definitely useful. And so fair to say that if you're going to move down this path uh, of using genomics, then you need to first set some goals of what it is you're trying to achieve. Yeah, like I would definitely say that. Um, I think anyone who is genomic testing, it's a crazy, interesting, crazy technology. There's no doubt about that, right? And the way it's progressed in the last 30, 40 years is huge. So it is for the producers who are either looking for a change or looking to grow. Um, and we, that's kind of our target audience. And so set some goals, whether it's, hey, I want to grow my herd by 5% each year, great. Let's grow your herd by 5% each year, but like, let's pick the most effective animals that are gonna do that. Let's pick the ones who are gonna give you the biggest calves the most efficiently. Let's pick the ones who are gonna never have, or not never, but who are genotype, uh, their genotype shows they're not gonna have any issues calving. Or, so it's definitely pick some goals um, set out because there's no point in doing this testing and then never using it. We want you to see value in it. We want you to use it. We want you to see a payoff on it. So, and that's what it is for. And that is how it's going to get there. It's 200 years of science um, that are supporting this. I know one interesting story I had is I had a customer, they were doing some sale bulls, tested a bunch of bulls. One of the bulls birth weight came back at a seven, which is high. You don't really want that if you're looking at birth weight. And they kind of looked at that and said, oh, that's baloney. That's not right. This bull was only 70 pounds when he was born. Kind of didn't use the test, went on, bred him. They ended up pulling three calves that year. Two of the pull, two of the ones that they pulled died. They're like, okay, something's fishy here. We never have to pull calves or they have these issues. They tested those calves. The parentage went back to that bull. So the science and what the genotype was showing was actually correct. And now they have a whole new belief in it. And they're, next time they get a seven birth weight bull, they're probably not gonna use it. So, so I think as sad as it was, as much as that sucks as a producer, it was very interesting to see that it is in the field and in the operation, it, it works. Well, and I think, like, like, say we we've seen it work in the dairy industry. It's just it's just how the how it's worked, right? And 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 our goals for longevity and 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 maintaining a genetically superior functional herd in in the future is those goals are very much different than, than the dairy sector. But they did a really good job of finding the ones that would milk. Mm -hmm. It's really helped them do it. Yeah. Um, and to, to Nikki and Cedric's point about, you know, trying to set some goals, that is one of the things Nikki had alluded to that um, I can offer through, so through the New Brunswick Cattle Producer Programming is an individual session with your, self, with your own firm, just to sort of set the goals, 
um, decode the the results and sort of make that whatever whatever your replacement plan might be or whatever the that kind of longer term plan and which traits can combine to kind of get you those or which indexes um, you should be looking at a little bit more than the others because again we the dairy world is a cautionary tale of a little bit of a single trait selection and we don't want to be single trait selectors. I think it's been proven that that's probably not the road we want to go down, but knowing which, which ones are important and which ones are deal breakers are, um, is just something that you want to have as a plan so that you can make decisions based on the data that you get back. <clears throat> So are there any other questions from the crowd? And David um, had posted the programs that I had alluded to before in, in the chat box. So you can check out there for the link, um, the GNB link. Thank you, David. And we are pretty much right on time. Um, Next steps are we were we're going to have another hour long session on August 19th and at same same bat time I believe same bat channel and it's going to be a little bit more specific to how to incorporate some of these tools into your herd. Um, you, you heard today about sort of what genomics is over overview on what the testing looks like, how it happens and all that jazz, a little bit on parentage and how those traits, traits pass by. So the next step is really getting into incorporating the beef genomics into your beef herd, into your personal herd. And then in November, we're going to have a session on analyzing genomic results. So the theory there is that by the time you guys run some of your calves through or your replacement heifers through um, to select which ones you're staying and which ones are going, then you can pull hair at the same time and pull all of your prospects and send, send hair away. Like I said, there's some genetic, uh, genetic enhancement programming that can help you do that, um, that can help you pay for it anyway, and pull hair or do the TSU samples while you're going through the shoots at vaccination time and send the data away, get the results back. I can do the personalized farm session with you at any time. And then we're doing kind of a, a overview of um, what those genetic genomic results look like for the greater, the greater audience on November 25th. So those are the next steps. And I thank everyone. Thank you, Nikki, very, very much for running through that this evening. Nikki's a great resource and you'll get this recording um, emailed to you for everybody who registered and I'm sure New Brunswick Cattle Producers will put it up on their um, YouTube channel at some point in time and appreciate the time and energy and I'm going to stop recording. Nope.